Thank you. Children may go to their Bible time and we'll bow together in prayer. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that as mortal beings above the lower creatures, the animals of this world, and for a time below the angels of the universe, and yet equipped and entitled to become the sons of God through faith in Christ. We come here rejoicing because we can worship you and honor you and seek the sense of your presence with us continually. We pray your blessing this morning on the word of God as our hearts consider it, teach us, and give us blessing from it. We pray for those that are laid aside with illness, Lord, and infirmities. Just watch over them, encourage them, strengthen them. We pray for our country in these days. You might give our leaders wisdom to seek and do those things which are right and to lead our nation in the right ways and turn hearts back to God. We pray for our missionaries, Father, as they serve you in various parts of the world. We thank you for them. Pray that you might bless them uh, in many ways. I pray for the Virgils there in Brazil. You might just bless them and uh, as they're home here on deputation for a while, you didn't equip them, keep them safe in their travels. Pray, Father, that you might uh, meet needs in each heart today. There are probably some here who are burdened or weighed down with difficulties and just encourage them through the Spirit of God. And teach us by your Spirit. Now we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Trust you have a note sheet with you, and you can refer to it from time to time. If you don't, wave your hand. We'll get one to you quickly. Uh, but uh, I want to call your attention to a couple little phrases that we find in the Scriptures. <clears throat> one is found in 1 Corinthians. It's, a, it's called, or it refers to, He that is spiritual. He that is spiritual. And in the book of Romans, we have another little phrase, to be spiritually minded. And so what does that mean? What does it mean to be spiritual? What does it mean to be spiritually minded? We could ask this morning, are you spiritual? Are you spiritually minded? Oh, you say, yes. Uh, I go to church sometimes several times a week. I read my Bible every day. Uh, I give a tract to the mailman every Christmas. And... Uh, uh, say I can say all the books in the Bible except for Habakkuk, I forget when to stop, uh, but otherwise I can say all the books of the Bible, so I must be spiritual. Well, all those things are good, but you know you might do all those things a hundred times over and still not be spiritual. How does a person get spiritual? What does it take to be spiritual? Well, if you hang a picture of Jesus on the wall, that make you spiritual. Or maybe you could... Put a scripture verse into your email address. You know, that might make you spiritual, do you think? Or uh, how would you know whether you're spiritual or not? How would you know if your friend was spiritual or not? Well, let me try and give you some pointers from the scripture on these things this morning. There are two basic types of individuals in this world. There are those who are saved and those who are unsaved. The unsaved are on the broad road that leads to destruction. And the saved are on the narrow way that leads to life. Some folk are on the road to an eternal hell. Others on the road to eternal heaven. I hope you know which road you're on. And if you take your Bibles and let's look at a few passages and contrast these two types of individuals. A turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15. First Corinthians 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Notice that phrase, the natural man. And then in verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, the natural man and the spiritual man. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. He refers to uh, it a little bit differently. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. The carnal person and the spiritual person. And then if you'd go over a few pages to the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 5, notice here, 
He refers to the person who is controlled by the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not walk in the flesh. Some are controlled by the flesh, and some are controlled by the spirit of God. Now turn over a few more pages to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Here it says, Be not drunk with wine or in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so he's referring to, in Galatians, those who, uh, <clears throat> those who are walking controlled by the flesh. And in the book of Ephesians, he's talking about those who are controlled by the Spirit of God, controlled by one or the other, the old sinful flesh or by the Spirit of God. And then there are different works these different individuals accomplish. Notice in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, he refers to this. Now the works of the flesh, and he lists them. And then you go down to uh, verse uh, uh, 22, and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. One produces the works of the flesh, one produces the works of the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, so then, uh, look again at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There are those who walk in the flesh, and those who walk in the spirit. And then if you'd go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those who walk after the Spirit. And uh, contrast to those who walk after the flesh. You can follow the flesh or follow the Spirit of God. And notice also, if we turn back uh, once again to the book of Galatians chapter 6. I skipped this one before. The Galatians chapter 6. Notice verses 8 and 9. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. Here he says this. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life, after last, life, life everlasting. Of sowing to the flesh, sowing to the spirit. And so there's a contrast in so many places in the Bible between the, the spiritual man and the natural man. The lost man and the saved man, the carnal man and the spiritual man, those who walk after the flesh, those who walk after the spirit, and the natural and the spiritual person. And we have this contrast in Scripture. So the natural man is the person who's living according to the works of the flesh. He's doing what he wants to do. This is what I feel like doing. This is what I want to do. And that's what he does. Uh, notice again in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Here's the things that the person who walks after the flesh may do. The, flesh, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, moral sins, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, emotional, and so on, uh, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are the things produced by the old sinful flesh, that old sinful nature that dwells within us. It produces those things. Those are the works of the flesh. And then you go on and notice verse 22, where he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and that is which is produced by the Spirit of God within us. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So the old sinful flesh will produce one kind of thing, and the Spirit of God working within us will produce a different kind of things. Uh, so they are produced uh, by different influences for different purposes. Now, here it gets a little bit confusing. Because sometimes the natural person who's living in the flesh, living according to the old sinful nature, sometimes that person does some good things, you know? 
They may help a little old lady cross the street or uh, donate blood to the Red Cross or make birdhouses for carrier pigeons or something like that, you know? And we look and say, oh, that's nice. They're doing good things. But all those things that they do are worthless to God because they're all contaminated and defiled by sin. Uh, so the natural person, the unsaved person, the natural person lives according to the sinful desires, but sometimes he does some things that outwardly look good. On the other hand, the spiritual person lives according to the Holy Spirit, but sometimes he does some things that are not so good. Sometimes he does things that are bad. So a person who's natural sometimes does some good things, and a person who's spiritual sometimes does some bad things. Now in northern Minnesota, in our lake and all the lakes in northern Minnesota, they have a loon. In fact, every lake has a pair of loons. Uh, and uh, they're the local loons for that lake, and they live there. And a loon is a marvelous bird. They're big. And they're uh, curious. They'll swim clear across the lake to see what you're doing. And you can talk to them. If you talk in their language, you can talk, and they'll talk back. And they're interesting creatures. Uh, but you wouldn't want to mess with one of them. They've got a beak like a sword, and their wings would beat you half to death. And if you'd get one of them riled up, you'd be in a bad way. I tell you, they would, uh, they would not do you any good. And they can swim. Oh, can they swim? They swim underwater. I finally found a picture of a loon swimming underwater. Now, they can swim underwater faster than a fish can swim because they catch fish. And they couldn't catch a fish unless they were swimming faster than a fish can. And you'll see them every once in a while come up and wave a fish around so they can show off what they caught. And uh, they can, they're excellent swimmers, better than fish. But when it comes to walking, they're not much good. Uh, they've got kind of spindly legs and big feet, and uh, they can kind of muddle along two or three feet to get out of the water to their nest, if it happens to be on the edge of the water there. Now, they can do that, but that's about all the walking they're good for. It's not natural for them to walk. It's natural for them to swim, and they can swim, and they can fly, but they're not much good for walking. Now, in northern Minnesota, we also have cats, and cats are very good at walking. Did you ever see a cat trip? I don't think so. I never have. And they put each foot down. They can walk down a, a little board fence with a big dog on each side of them. They put every foot into exactly the place, and they don't miss a step. They're really good at walking. Now, they're not much for swimming. I mean, they can swim if they have to. You throw them in, and they'll swim, but that's not their thing. They don't like it. They're not very good at it. And so you have some creatures that are good at some things, not others, and other creatures who are good at those things, but not the other things. And that's the way it is with, this, with us, the natural person. Maybe good at some things. He's good at natural things, carnal things, sinful things, not very good at doing good things. And then there's the spiritual person who uh, ought to be good at doing spiritual things, but he's not so good at doing unspiritual things. And so the natural person is the person who outwardly lives according to the flesh. And the saved person is one who should live according to the Holy Spirit. So a person can be saved and live like an unsaved person sometimes. A person can be unsaved and kind of look like a Christian sometimes. Uh, but uh, they both do most commonly that which is natural for them. Now I want you to look at three verses with me. Turn back to the book of Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. And notice here verse 7. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. The writer says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a person thinks, that's the kind of person that it is. You think this way, you're going to live this way. You think that way, you'll live that way. Now turn on to the book of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Verses 34, Matthew 12, 34. Jesus speaking, he says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? 
For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Here were these crowds, and they were trying, coming along to Jesus, trying to show them how religious and spiritual they were when they were a bunch of scoundrels. Verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. If you have an evil heart, you're going to produce evil actions. Have a good heart, you're going to produce good actions. Then go over to the book of Luke, chapter 6. Luke, chapter 6. Luke, chapter 6, verse 45. Again, Jesus is speaking. He says basically the same thing. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. The mouth speaks on the basis of what is in the heart. A person acts according to what is in his heart. So uh, we know these things, we think this way, and lo and behold, that's the way we live. You see, how we live is determined by how we think. Now, going on to the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. Notice here. Romans, chapter 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. Now, some... After the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. Others, mind the things of the spirit. Then verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Here's a person, their mind, their thought process, their thinking is carnal, that is worldly, fleshly, sinful, and the end of that, of course, is death. And here's another person, uh, the, his mind is based on things that are spiritual and good and useful, and godly, and he is spiritually minded. And so some people mind the things of the flesh, and some people mind the things of the spirit. Some people are carnally minded, and some people are spiritually minded. And the way we live is determined by our mind, whether we're carnally minded or spiritually minded. And so we think about different things, and this thinking falls into three categories, three categories. Material, temporal, and personal. Material things, that's stuff. And temporal things, that's for now. And personal things, that's for me. And you see, uh, our attitudes in those things determines how we will think and how we will live. Now, my attitude toward possessions, oh, all the stuff I can have. My attitude toward time. Now, when can I get these things? My attitude toward self. These things are for me. So, basically, the carnal mind says, uh, what do I want? I want stuff. When do I want it? I want it now. Who do I want it for? I want it for me. That's the carnal mind. And the carnal mind results in that kind of living. The carnal mind, the unsaved attitude, is the way the lost person thinks. But the person who's saved, and if he's saved and not walking with God, he thinks the same way. Though spiritually, that is, he's been born again into the family of God, but he still thinks like the unsaved person, still thinks carnally. Now let's look at this carnally minded person and the details. Think about this a bit. Carnal attitude about things. Oh, things, that's what's important. I want things, clothes and cars and uh, better furniture and a nice house and knickknacks and money and a retirement account and a retirement plan and furniture and a new grill and whatever I can think of. I want those things. Now, it's not wrong to have things. But it is wrong to make things important. Because the, but the carnal mind says, it's things that matter. That's what life is about. The abundance of life consists in what I have. The more I have, the better life is. And so I want things. 
And that person is happy. The more things they have, they think they'll be happier if they have more things. And they'll be more secure if they have more money. And so they want things. They dream about things. They think about things. They go shopping for things. They buy things. And that's what's important to them. I knew years ago a couple that uh, they, every Saturday, they had to go buy something. Didn't matter, they didn't need anything, they had to go buy something because that was what they did on Saturday. They bought things and the whole place was crammed with things but they always had to buy more because that was what they did. That was their entertainment, get more things. And uh, most of the time, you know, that's what interests us, getting things and uh, thinking about things and looking for things and trying to find things, and buying things, and taking care of things, and bragging about things, and our whole life gets wrapped up in things. And I would ask you, how important are things to you? Is that what you're really involved in? Is that the main focus of your life, is getting things? What more things can I get? Remember that rich fool in the Bible? He said, oh, I've got a lot of stuff, but the crops are really good. I'm going to get more. I'm going to build out, uh, tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and I'm going to fill them up to the top, and then I'm going to say, oh, now you've got it made. You've got all these things, your money to buy everything you want, and you can take it easy and eat and drink and have a good time because you've got all these things. And God said, thou fool, this night your soul's required of you, and then what's going to become of all those things? Oh, how foolish to let our lives be too wrapped up in things. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God will take care of the things, but we don't need to love them. Again, 1 John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now be content, Paul said, with what you have. Remember Jesus says he had nowhere to lay his head. And in the book of Hebrews it talks about those who took joyfully the spoiling of their substance uh, knowing that they have a better substance in heaven. They didn't care about things so much. And remember Job who lost everything he had, all his, his family, his houses, his cattle, all his crops, all his riches, everything was gone. That didn't bother him that much. He said the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. What's your attitude about things? Oh, oh, what is your mental attitude about things? Are you carnally minded? Oh, stuff is going to satisfy me. Stuff will make me happy. Or are you spiritually minded? Said, like the songwriter, a tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a mansion for me over there. Carnal attitude about things. What about a carnal attitude toward time? We're creatures of time. Our time is limited. And we want as much time as we can, and we want to use it any way that we want. And we want to use our time for ourselves and our things. You say, oh, this person says, oh, well, yeah, it's nice to think about the sweet by and by, but I'm really more concerned about now. What can I have now? What can I do now? Heaven, yeah, someday I'll think about heaven. Salvation, well, I don't really have time to bother about that now. More important things now. And uh, serving the Lord, attending church, well, I don't really have much time for those things. I'm so busy with other things. And uh, I'll fit God in when it's convenient, you know. When nothing else is going on, then I have a little time left for God. But right now, I want to enjoy myself and do what I want to do. Now, that's the attitude of unsaved people. And many believers end up with the same attitude as they. A spiritual mind is different. Spiritual minded says this. It says, now is the accepted time for salvation. It says, redeem the time because the days are evil. Uh, today is the time not to harden your hearts. And these afflictions are but for a moment. But they work for us a far more eternal weight of glory. Lay up treasures in heaven where they're not going to rot away. And uh, so the carnal person says, the emphasis is what can I have now, right now? Don't want to wait for things. Don't want it in eternity. I want it now. Well, what's the carnal attitude about self? Attitude about material? Things is what I need. Time, want it now. 
What's the attitude about self? Well, self says what's important is what I want. What's going to make me feel good? What's going to make me happy? What's best for me? I want to win the argument. Nobody's going to push me around. Nobody's going to take advantage of me. We need to do it my way. And basically, the person who thinks as the carnal man thinks says, everything is here to please me. The spiritual minded has a different attitude. Scriptures say, look, not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you who, as Christ, humbled himself and became a servant. Like John, who said, Jesus Christ must increase and I must decrease. This kind of mind says, what I want is what's best for you, not what's best for me. Not what makes me happy, what's going to make you happy. Here's a little guide to keep in mind. It's worth about more than $1,000 at the psychiatrist's office. If you just put these things down, note them on your paper there. The more you, concerned you are about other people, the happier you're going to be. And the more concerned you are about yourself, the more miserable, miserable you're going to be. Oh, there's so much in that if you think on that. And the people who are just occupied with themselves are miserable, unhappy, sad people. And those who are occupied with others are happy people. Just mark it down and keep that in mind. And use that in training your children because you don't want to make your children the center of their world because to do so is going to make them self-centered and miserable persons all of their life. Teach them to be spiritually minded, concerned about others. So the, personal, the person who's carnal minded he just is concerned about things and now and what's for me. The spiritual-minded person is concerned about eternal rewards and other people. And how we need to analyze how we think. Because the way we think determines how we live and what kind of people we are. Whether we're carnal or spiritual. And there are many saved people who think and therefore live like the carnal person. And they wonder, why isn't my life so full of troubles and problems and fighting and, and uh, dissatisfaction, all those things? Well, because they're reaping the harvest of carnal thinking. Because carn to be carnal-minded is death. And to be spiritually-minded is life and peace and joy. And that is the joy that Christ has for us as we learn to trust him and think as he would have us to think. Shall we bow in prayer? As we bow in prayer, let me ask you, uh, what's your life revolve around? Are you just mainly concerned about things, temporal things, selfish things? Really, it doesn't sound good to say that. If that's where your life is, uh, things are out of focus and things are not right. And uh, we need to give thought to that and where you are. And if you're thinking as a carnal person, you need to change that and think as God would have you to think. Not I, but Christ, be exalted. Not for me, but for him. Not for now, but for eternity. Not for material things that are soon going to be dissolved someday, but things that are going to last for all eternity. Maybe you need to make some changes in your thinking this morning. I'd like to pray for you. You have a special need in your heart. You see some things in your life where you're just thinking wrong, not, don't have the right priority, don't have the right way of thinking. Now, could I pray for you as we close this morning? Heads bowed and eyes closed, but just raise your hand, put it down, and I might pray for you. Are there others? Others? Wrong priorities? Thinking the wrong way? Father, we thank you for your grace. We pray that you might teach us from the Word of God to think as we should and to live as we ought as a result of that. And so, Lord, bless each one who has a concern. Pray that people might see uh, the reality of their life and what they're really doing, how they're living, and analyze and make adjustments in their thinking. We might think according to the mind of Christ, which is always before us and would be in us. And so, guide, we pray, and bless. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Number 460 in your hymnals.